Merciful and gracious is my God to me. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. And I will tell his goodness through eternity. Bless the Lord, oh Stand before your maker Full of wonder, full of fear Come behold his power and glory Yet with confidence draw near For the one who holds the heavens And commands the stars above Is the God who bends to bless us With an unrelenting love
walking with us still Turning tragedy to triumph Turning agony to praise There is blessing in the battle So take heart and stand amazed Rejoice When you cry to him he hears Your voice He will wipe away your tears Rejoice Good morning. Good morning. Let me invite you to make a way to a seat. We're going to begin our time of worship this morning. Ah, what a beautiful spring day in sunny Somerville. <laughs> ah, so nice and warm outside. And just getting ready for all the summer festivities. Those of you who are joining us by live stream, we are so glad that you're with us today, and we hope that um, you'll be blessed as a part of being with us either today or later this week, but we also want to encourage you to be connecting with a local fellowship near you so that you might really engage in the fellowship of faith and encourage one another and be encouraged in the Word by that fellowship. And those of you who are in Somerville, we just encourage you now is a, a good time to begin to come back and reconnect and 
to not forsake the assembling together with the saints. So let me encourage you toward that end. If you are um, needing to convey something to us here, of course, you can use the communication cards on the table behind the partition. Those of you who are joining us by live stream, we'd love to hear from you by email, which you can do at gcbcsomerville at gmail.com. Let me encourage you, if you um, are interested and are, are wondering what, what happened in the first few centuries after the apostles began to fade away and before the Scriptures were completely put together, what was going on in the church in those days? And if you've ever wondered about that and why that's still important and why it is vitally um, still a part of how it is that we gather, I want to encourage you to join Mike McAvoy at Panera on Sunday mornings at 9 o'clock. These are also being posted on the internet later in the week, so you can catch them there as well. But there is a seminar that's going on right now on church history, and really want to encourage you toward that and to be a part of that. So if you'd like more information, Mike, raise your hand. He's in the back, and he can give you more information about that later. So 9 o'clock Sunday mornings at Panera. GCBC men, this Saturday at uh, the Kids Clubhouse, 9 o'clock in the morning, we'll be gathering together for a time of fellowship and food and time in the Word. So let me encourage you men, mark your calendars and be with us this Saturday, 9 o'clock, right at the Kids Clubhouse. And of course, our offering is on the table and in the back. And just by way of the offering, I want to remind you today, uh, shared last month a little bit about one of the people, Aniel Baez, that we're supporting in Guadalajara doing uh, ministry on campus. There's another guy that we're supporting as well through our offerings through the year, a guy by the name of Riley Lanier. And Riley right now is ministering through campus outreach at CSU. But he's kind of in a transition because currently he's in Montreal, Canada, preparing to get to Birmingham. Now, how's that work? Well, not Birmingham, Alabama, but Birmingham, England. And he's trying to go specifically so that he might connect with North African, specifically Muslims, who have a huge concentrated living spot in Birmingham in England, and he's trying to prepare and get there. So let me encourage you to continue to be praying for Riley as he continues to do work at CSU and begins to try to transition to Birmingham, England, and do the work that God is leading him to do with campus outreach. And the good news is that the the work at CSU will continue because there's already a leader in place, and in fact, some of the students that he's been ministering to are already taking the reins of responsibility for that ministry, so God is doing good things. So thank you for your support and how we are helping with Riley Lanier. Be praying for him, and um, thank you for how you're giving so that we can support guys like Riley in the ministry that he's doing. Now, with that, let me invite you to pray and bow your head with me, and we're going to begin our time of worship together as we gather seeking God. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning. We praise you for the hope that is ours in Christ alone. We thank you that he who was perfect without sin in any way, completely righteous, took our place, took our sin upon himself, laid down his life in our place, taking our judgment so that we through Him on the cross and through the empty tomb might have a way to be at peace with You, so that the war might be undone, not so that necessarily, Father, that, that Your wrath would be removed, that You would no longer see us as sinners, but You had made a way for us to be declared righteous and found righteous and to be spotless in Your presence. Father, that's what we come to rest in this morning, that through Your Son, who is our wisdom and our peace, we have access to You because of Your gracious kindness toward us. We were still sinners. We were enemies and at enmity with You, and yet You loved us, sent Your Son for us, so that we might be made right and prepared and readied one day to be dressed in spectacular raiment of righteousness to be presented in Your presence. Father, we can't wait for that day, but until then, God, shape us today. Let Your Spirit move. Let Your Word 
work in our hearts and in our minds. Father, I pray even now as we have sprung forward last night, Father, I pray that you would clear the cobwebs out of our minds and help our our eyes to focus in and our ears to be attentive to how you desire to move this morning. And so we praise you and we come rejoicing because of your Son who is our life and our all. We thank you for this hope and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. Let's join our voices together this morning as we sing. Michael.
today's scripture reading comes from uh, Matthew 6, 19 through 24, and it says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So, if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. As we go into this next song, let's continue to sing of um, the hope that we have in Christ um, and proclaim to one another the, the truth that, uh, that he is good, that he's with us, and that we can come and rest in him. So let's sing this song that we introduced last week, Come to Jesus, Rest in Him.
Cause you teach my song to rise to you When temptation comes my way When I cannot stand, I'll fall on you Jesus, you're my hope and stay Stand out fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Let's pray together. Lord, as we gather here this morning, we recognize that we need you. We need you for our salvation, for your grace and mercy in our lives. And we need you every day of our lives as we walk through life. Lord, we still... We are yours as children of God, but we still struggle in the flesh. And every day we need you, and you are there for us. And you give us the strength that we need if we choose to take it. Thank you for being there. Thank you for the mercy that you show in our lives. You're the father of mercies. Each day you bring a mercies to us, Lord, and we praise you for that. Help us, Lord, to live lives of gratitude and praise to you for the mercy that you pour out in our lives. Lord, we ask we continue to pray for a number in our congregation. We continue to pray for Paige Dowdy as she would just care for her and that she would, um, surgery would go well for her. Pray for Erica that she would continue to uh, be able to deal, feel better with this pregnancy. Kathy Callahan's daughter, Kimberly, as she is back in the uh, hospital for more surgery, pray you be with her and the doctors through that. Be with Kathy as she's traveling and there by her side. Thank you that Brian's father, Brian Collins' father, is making some um, Recovery, continue to help him to recover. And Lord, I pray for uh, Audrey Gatto, Lord, a, a young young girl that had a head injury. Thank you, Lord, that there is some improvement. I ask God that you would continue to bring healing to her. And Lord, we praise you for uh, Robbie's election. I pray, God, that you would just help him, give him the strength to stand to the swamp that is in the state, in any elected elected office, Lord. Help him to stand for you. Help him to stand for the truth and stand for what is right and not uh, be swayed by the deal-making that goes on. This uh, strengthen him. Thank you for him. Pray your blessing upon him. Pray also, Lord, for your continued blessing upon our church family. I pray that we would live lives that bring honor to you. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Rock of ages, clap for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wound inside which flow be of sin the double cure. Save from wrath and make me pure. I clean, make it come to be for trust, helpless look to be for grace, foul I to the fountain fly, wash me safe. God, we thank you for this uh, time of singing today that we have been able to sing of the grace and the mercy that we have in you. Um, God, we thank you for rescuing us from our sins, for making a way that we might be able to have freedom in your name. God, move today uh, through the preaching and through the teaching of your word. Move in our hearts and in our minds and draw us closer to you as a result of it. You are a good God, and you've called us to you in Christ. So please continue to move for your glory today. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. If you would, turn with me to James chapter 4 as we continue our walk through this incredibly relevant and good piece of God's Word, although all of God's Word is good. James chapter 4. Today we're going to begin a section that we will uh, look at today and next Sunday, and it comes in this context of what we've been looking at that is honing in on some of the difficulties and problems that are happening in the church. And so let me read for us this morning James chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. James chapter 4, starting at verse 1, going to verse 12. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and you do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You don't have because you don't ask, and you ask and don't receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people. Don't you know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that Scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us, but he gives more grace? Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble." 
Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God. He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and He will exalt you. Don't speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge. There's only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? This is the Word of God. Amen indeed. Well, my son, Michael, and his wife are spending some time with us as they try to prepare the home that they just recently bought to be ready and to to go in. And if you'd like to help them, ask them. They would love your help. Uh, So would we. But... (laughs) <laughs> no, we're enjoying this, and one of the privileges of them being with us is not only our wonderful, delightful, smiling grandson with us, but they've also brought this other creature that they've named Fizby. I call her Frisbee. It's this little um, schizophrenic cat, this bipolar cat, this cat that one minute is just lovely and delightful and is purring and is all love, and in the next second she has turned from Mrs. Thisbe to Dr. Jekyll, I mean just this creature of Satan that is swatting at you with with vicious claws and biting at you at every turn and is just running and all over the house. And I looked at her this morning and I said, Frisbee, that's what I call her. Her name is Thisbee, but I call her Frisbee because, you know, I want to throw her across the room, um, (laughs) not hoping that she'll come back. I said, what's wrong with you, Frisbee? Well, yeah, she just looked up at me and hissed and No, she didn't hiss. Actually, I've won her over because I keep giving her deli meat, and she loves that, and so uh, she is a little bit softer to me. But when I said, what's wrong with you, it hit me. There's nothing wrong with her. She's a cat. That's what cats do, right? Fickle, yeah. Um, But that's what cats do. That's what they are. That's how God created them. There's nothing wrong with her. She's acting exactly the way a cat ought to act, right? You might not like it, but then don't get a cat, right? Why do churches fight? What's wrong with them? What's going on? Why is there conflict in fellowships? Perhaps it's because people are acting exactly the way that their hearts are bent and inclined to act, and perhaps it's because that in the church, if Billy Graham is correct, there is a fertile mission field because you will find in any given fellowship a collection of redeemed and sinners. It shouldn't be that way. The church should not be that. But perhaps when conflict arises, it is because sinners who are not redeemed and not saved are in the midst and in the camp. And that's a good warning for us to look at ourselves this morning and to say, where do I stand with God through Christ Jesus? I'll never forget the moment that she looked at me and said, Mike, it's going to be okay. Change is coming, but I just want our church to be prominent again and to be a place for the lawyers and the prominent people of this town And I knew where the conflict and the fighting was coming from. Sinners were in the midst who were not redeemed. Although she was very prominent in the church, big giver, top dollar figures, 
and looked upon as being one who uh, was influential, and yet that's where the source of the conflict was coming from. Now, James has been helping us to see here's how to investigate and look at a group of people, a, a church, a, a people of God or yourself, and to determine is what I profess legitimate? Is my faith in action right? And so, if you'll remember this section that we're looking at, he's been telling us and helping us to see that a people rightly submitted to God through Christ, through the gospel, through the cross, through the empty tomb, through the blood that was shed for us, those people who are redeemed and transformed and born again, born from above, ought to be sweet and refreshing because the source of their heart is no longer bitterness, it's now sweet water. It's different. There should be a different stream. And so, he's been helping us to see that submission to God is evident, should be evident in our conversation. We looked at that a few weeks ago in chapter 3, verses 1 through 12, where the tongue is a barometer of the heart, and it, it's, it's the overflow of the heart that the mouth speaks, and the life of the person is moving. And then we looked at last week, our humble lives, that there's a wisdom that comes from above, and it's not earthly, and the wisdom of a life set on that and submission to that is actually humbled to and bridled by God's Word. There's this this loving what God loves and hating what God hates, and there's this life and submission to that. And the outflow of that ought to be peaceful lives, a peaceful fellowship, if you will. Now, we're going to get to that, but what we're going to look at today are two obstacles to that peace that he hones in on, some of the difficulties that are happening in among God's people. And then next week, we're going to be looking at uh, the path to peace in the fellowship. What, what should we pursue? What should we be after? What should be the tenor and tone and, and the, the symphony of our lives? And so, we'll look at that. And today, we're going to look at verses 1 through 6, and next week, we'll pick up verses 7 through 12 in this section. And, and today, let me just talk about, if I could, from James two obstacles that rear themselves and show themselves and why it is that some fellowships end up not as a place of peace and sweet refreshness, but as a place of conflict and difficulty. And the first obstacle, I think, is this, is that there's conflicted hearts, conflicted hearts. I think we're going to see this very clearly in verses 1, 2, and 3. And my contention to you is this this morning, that hearts that are burning with passion for anything other than God's glory and the gospel are a tinderbox ready to explode in the fellowship. If you have a passion and a burning desire for something other than God's glory, something other than the gospel of Jesus Christ, whereby sinners are made to be at peace with the living God, and and if your passion is something other than that, and your desire is not to put on center stage Jesus Christ and have the spotlight on Him, then I'm suggesting that you are a tinderbox waiting to explode in the fellowship. And I think that's where James leads us. Notice what he says in verse 1, and it's, it's sad that we can't read Greek. Some of you can, um, and it's sad that it's what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you, because really what James is saying is, where does it come from? Where? From where quarrels? From where? Fighting. Among you. In other words, Where is this coming from? Now, he's not asking this from, I don't know. He's asking this from all of the wisdom that is being given to him by the Holy Spirit and that is from above, and and he's going to walk us through exactly where it does come from. But he's asking on our account, from where? And we know, of course, from where. You go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, and there's this lovely scene of Eve with the serpent, and seemingly while Adam is standing right by, and they are tempted to question God's character, and tempted to question God's Word, and did God really say, and you know, if you follow God's way, you're just going to have this miserable life where you don't achieve all of your fullest potential, and all of your wildest dreams, and the irony is, is that they had absolutely everything that they could ever desire in fellowship with God. 
And Satan was giving them not the hopes of something better than that, but less. And in that instance, she saw that the fruit was good, not only in pleasing to, to look at and to, to have, but to eat. And in rebellion, she ate of it and she handed it to her, her man who was there, and God came in and they fled. And immediately after that, what happens? They're fleeing from God because they're scared because now they're at enmity with God. Now there is separation where there was once sweet fellowship. Now there is deadness and fear. And not only is there now enmity with God, there's conflict in their own hearts. And what am I going to do with this guilt? And so they have to flee from God. But not only conflict with themselves, but conflict with one another. How do we know? Because God starts questioning. And He begins with Adam. He goes in backwards order because Adam ate and Eve ate first. And the, the serpent, He goes just in backward order and says, Adam what's going on? He addresses him first. You remember he said, it was me, God. I'm at fault. No, what did he do? That woman that you gave me, God, if you hadn't put her here, and if she hadn't been here, none of this would have happened. It's her fault, and probably it's your fault too, God. There's the conflict, not only with himself and with God, but with Eve, his wife, that God had joined together. You fast forward just a little bit in the story, and you get to chapter 4, and what happens? The world, according to sin, is not delightful. Cain and Abel are on the stage, brother and brother on the scene, and what happens? Most of you know the story. They both bring a sacrifice and an offering. One God accepts and one God rejects. And as a result of that, what ensues? Murder, death. And that's the world that we live in. That's the world where we find ourselves. So when James says, from where, from where, he says, I know exactly where. It's an indictment of us as rebellious people apart from Christ, and it's indicative and it will be on display where people who are not redeemed and not regenerate and not born again exist. In fact, this idea of quarrels and fights, um, th this is like warfare. This is all-out battle that is on display here. And it shouldn't be in the assembly of saints, and yet here it is. It's this national warfare that has, had come to mean any kind of antagonism. In other words, this, these fightings are happening because there's some desire and there's some want and there's some passion that's not being met or is an obstacle to, and so there's battles and fighting. And notice he says, from where quarrels and from where fights, where, where are they coming from among you? That's not just um, an individualized American reading that if you'll just look in your own personal hearts, this is among you within the gathering, because the, the word here is plural. In your midst, where are these quarrels and these fightings coming from? Not just individually in your hearts, among you as the corporate reality and expression of the body of Christ. Where is this coming from? And he says this, isn't it this? Expecting that you will heartily say, yes, that's exactly it, whether it indicts you or not. But he says, isn't it this, that your passions are at war within you? That word passions means your desires. It's, it's actually the word from which we get hedonism. Isn't it this, that your pleasures and your sensual lusts that you're desiring are at war among you? In other words, your chief goal is your own self-oriented interest and not the glory of God. And when that happens and when your pleasure is either blocked or somebody else is getting what you're hoping to get, guess what happens? Battles. In fact, notice what he says in verse 2. You desire and you don't have. 
Now, I'm going to take that so you murder to the next section, but uh, this, this first phrase, he says, you desire, you, you want something. Now, in the context, I think he specifically, not many of you should become and have this desire to be what? Teachers, to be seen as wise and, and knowledgeable and, and stand up and give directions to the church. You shouldn't desire that. And you're desiring it, and you're not getting it, and you don't have it. In fact, this word for desire is it's, it's eagerly, eagerly seeking after something that you're not getting. And because you don't have it, then he goes on, he says, murder ensues. You covet, so you murder, you covet, and you cannot obtain. In other words, you, you murder and you burn with envy because either what you're hoping to get, somebody else is getting, or what you're hoping to get, nobody will give it to you, or you're being blocked from getting it, and you're not able to obtain it. Now, I don't know that the authorities of that day were actually investigating murders in the church. I think what he's doing here is he's linking up for us something exactly like Jesus did for us, although I want us to see this. Turn over to 1 John real quick, chapter 3, verse 15, and notice what 1 John says. Just because I think he's building a case for these people to really hone in and say, here's who you really are. He's already done this. The spring, remember... Uh, a bitter spring cannot produce sweet water. We saw that last uh, two weeks ago, right? So he's saying, look, the, the spring is deficient if this is the outflow and this is the output of your life. And notice what um, 1 John 3, 15 says, everyone who hates his brother is a what? Is a what? A murderer. That doesn't mean that you've actually physically murdered them. It means if you have this kind of enmity in your heart toward your brother, that's where murder comes from. And you know this. What's it say? No murderer has what? Has what? Eternal life where? Abiding in Him. That's a pretty strong indictment, isn't it? hate. Go back with me for a second to Matthew chapter 5. Listen to what Jesus says. In Matthew 5, Verse 21, he said, you've heard that it was said to those of old, you should not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. I mean, how many people have you ever heard legitimize themselves saying, I know I'm not that great, but I've never killed anyone? Well, John has already told us, if you have hatred toward your brother, then that's the same as what? Murder. Now, here's what Jesus says, but I say to you that everyone who's angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Hatred, anger, they're the source of fights and quarrels and warfare, and what are they demonstrating? that those who are bent toward that and those who are inclined toward that are demonstrating there is no eternal life abiding in them. That's what James is saying. Now, coming back to James, he says, you're burning with envy for something. You're desiring this eagerly, and you can't obtain it, and so what happens? You've got this anger, you've got this hatred in you, and it's the very source of where murder comes from, and this is why it's boiling over in this tinderbox, exploding in quarrels and warfare and fights. And he says, the truth is, you don't even ask. You don't have because you don't ask. Prayer is not even the first 
thing. You're not asking from the wisdom above. Remember, he's already said, if any of you lacks wisdom in the midst of difficulty, what should you do? Ask of God, and God will give generously. He, he gives that. Go to God. This is a sign of one who's humbled under the sovereignty and the goodness of our Father, is that you see Him as one who loves to hear from His children, and you ask. Prayer is the first thing. He says, you don't even ask. It's not even on your radar. And because it's not on your radar, it's betraying the situation that you're in currently spiritually. And then he even goes further. Notice verse 3. When you do ask, oh, by the way, you don't receive. Why? Because you ask what? Wrongly. Why is it wrongly? Well, because you're asking to spend it on your own hedonism. In other words, God has become the means for you to get your own sensual desires met and fulfilled. In other words, you want a position, you want a place of prominence, you want to be seen as, and so God, help me to get it. God just becomes a means to your end. In other words, He's not God, He's your puppet. He's the marionette on your strings that you're maneuvering and manipulating so that you can get more from Him. And He says, you're asking wrongly. You're not asking, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, let your glory, let your fame spread out. Your, let my glory and my fame, let it be seen in the assembly. Let me be in a place of position and prominence. Let me have, let me get. Let, it, it's all about me. Why would God pour out for that? Remember, Hearts burning with a passion for anything other than God's glory and the gospel are a tinderbox ready to explode. And so now their chief end, it's not God, it's not the gospel, nor is it Jesus Christ, it's their pleasure. And their pleasure is driving their prayer. In fact, literally it's saying they're asking to squander God's blessings on their own hedonistic pleasures. Wisdom, I'm not going to God for wisdom. Temptation, yeah, I, that's what I want. God, will you help me to get what my heart is longing for? People in need, <laughs> I don't care about people in need. The rich, I'll cuddle up with them, I'll cozy up with them because they probably have the commodities that I need to get what I want. So the poor people, I don't have time for them, but the rich people, I'll, I'll go to them. And then they stand up in the assembly and they act wise and knowledgeable, and here's everything that you need to know. Isn't this, if you really dig and troll well on social media, don't you see this on display? People have all kinds of spiritual wisdom, one minute, and the next minute, all of their sensual desires on display for everyone to see. Friends, that's not Christianity. Look at Philippians chapter 3. Here's what Paul said about this kind of situation. Now, keep a a mark here because we're going to come back to Philippians chapter 3 in just a second. But notice what he says here. At verse 19, their end is what? Destruction. Their God is their belly. In other words, their lusts, their desires, their passions, their pleasures is what's driving them, and they're serving those things. They glory, in other words, they put on display and they tout the glory that is their shame with minds set on what? earthly things. I think this is what James is saying, that when your mind is on earthly things and and you're about the hedonisms and the desires and the passions and the pleasures, and, and that's the passion, that's the glory of what you're about, and how can I get in, and how can I wiggle in and make myself known and, and get more? You are a prescription for disaster in the church, and you can be sure that quarrels and fights are ready to happen. It's just inevitable. 
Now, while this is the case, these conflicted hearts, this is a good warning for us today. Because notice next, the next obstacle is what I'm going to call fatal friendships, or fatal friendship, rather. And friends, in fellowship with the world, we're going to see that James is going to tell us, have no place among God's people. Friends who are friends in fellowship with the world, that their friendship is with the world, have no place among God's people. Notice what he says, verse 4, in light of this wars and quarrels and fights and these conflicted hearts that, and these hearts that are seeking to, to come to God to, to squander all of the things that He might give for their own pleasure. Notice what He says and how He identifies them. You adulterous people. I mean, this is not a term of endearment, is it? In fact, God's people throughout Scripture are considered the wife of the Lord in the Old Testament, especially Jeremiah. You go to a book like Hosea where that's on display, and, um, and, and certainly you can't not think of Ephesians chapter 5 where it talks about the groom and the bride as a picture of who? Jesus and the church, His bride, the church. And so there's this ongoing Scripture metaphor where God's people are the wife or, or the bride of the Lord. And so when he says, you adulterous people, what is he saying? It looks and appears as if God's people are messing around with a false lover. In fact, it's a shocking insertion here. Because notice who it is that God's people are messing around with in the context here. Who is it? Notice what he says. Don't you know that friendship with who? The world is enmity with God. Now, the world here is the system that is at work and on display in our broken world. It's it's a, a world, not, not the globe, but, it, but it's speaking of what's at work in our world that is in opposition to God and everything that is right and holy and good. It's what happened after the fall. And he says that these are these adulteresses because there's this friendship, but that might seem a little too harsh. How, how can people who are friends be called adulteresses. Well, the word here is a word, friend, that means a person who has this, this love or affection with one that is, they're connected with or they have an association with. So, this is not a one-time connection. This is not a deep love that's coming from a moment of thinking about sin this is an ongoing connectedness, an association, and a love for this connection and this association. In other words, it's, it's a fellowship. There's this common interest and this common desires, and, and, and they're saying that, that we, we have much in common with the world, the world which, by the way, is broken and moving in opposition to God. And so this is not a picture of delight. That's something that's good. This is not like, okay, well, get close to the world and, and go after all of the ways that they do things and all of their methods and all of their schemes so that you can show them Jesus. That, that, that just doesn't work. That, that's what he's saying. That, that will never work. In fact, he plays it out for us. Turn over to John chapter 5. Here's a great passage that plays on this word friend to help you to see how deep this friendship is really talking about. Notice verse 13, John chapter 5. 
I'll just start at verse 12. This is the commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Now, remember what John tells us over in 1 John is, if you have hatred to your brother, you're a what? A murderer, and there's no eternal life abiding in you. Here's why, because here's the commandment, love one another as I have loved you. And then notice what he says, verse 13, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his who? His friends. In other words, this kind of friendship, same word in view here, same word root, it, it, this friendship has this idea of sacrificial, John 15, verse 13. Did I say five? Sorry, John 15. Sorry, my, my apologies. John 15. Verse 13, greater love is no one than this, than someone lay down his life for his friends. In other words, with, with this friendship, there's this sense of sacrificial love that's connected with it. This word, by the way, is philia. It's where Bob came from, that beautiful, wonderful city that throws snowballs at Santa. Amen. The city of brotherly love, Philadelphia, right? Right? What a delightful little place. Brotherly shove. There you, yeah. Well, there's a sacrificialness, this laying down of life for his friends. But notice it goes even further. Notice what he says next. And you are my friends if you what? Do what I command you. In other words, there's obedience there. In other words, there's this sacrificial love. I want to lay down my life for my friend, and I want to obey this friend. But not only that, notice verse 15. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant doesn't know what his master is doing. You're not servants anymore. Now you're my friends. And here's why you're my friends, because all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. In other words, there's this intimate knowledge. Now, Take this. Now, this is what Jesus is saying it should look like in the church as we're friends with Christ and loving Christ. We ought to have this sacrificialness for the gospel and Christ and the brothers, and there ought to be this obedience to Jesus, and there ought to be this inside intimacy and this knowledge and this wisdom that we say, oh, you know what? Here's what you need. You need a word from Jesus Christ, not from me, but from Him. And He says, look, don't you know, you adulteresses, that to be friends with the world, in other words, you're laying down your life for the world, I'm going to defend the way the world works. I, I'm going to defend to the end who the world is and what they're about, and I'm going to be obedient to it. If the world says this, I just lock, walk in lock, step, and barrel with what the world says. And, and when they say this about LGBTQ, well, that's what I say too because I love the world and I'm laying down my life for the world and because I've got this intimate inside knowledge because I'm so close, I know exactly the way the mechanisms of the world think. To be that kind of friend with the world cannot be that kind of friend with Jesus simultaneously, and it places you at odds, and not just at odds, at enmity with God. In other words, you're His enemy. In other words, you're walking in darkness, and the truth is not in you. You can find this all throughout the New Testament, Acts chapter 13. Paul and Barnabas look at the guy and say, you are an enemy of God. Romans chapter 8 tells us that those who walk according to the flesh and doing the things of the flesh, they're not spiritually right. They're enemies of the Spirit. In Colossians 1, Paul says those who are enemies of the cross in this way, fulfilling and satisfying all of their pleasures and all of their desires, they're enemies of righteousness and the cross needing reconciliation. And in fact, this is what Paul says. Go back with me once again to Philippians chapter 3. If you didn't look at the context, let's just zoom out a little bit. These people who their belly is their God and are glorying in their shame, listen to what he says, verse 17, brothers, hone in, listen, hear the word of the Lord, take note, 
brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. In other words, we walked, we heard, we learned from Christ. He moved us from servants to friends. We've heard from Him. Listen, here's the truth. Here is the love of God on display for us. Walk in this. Why? Verse 18, for many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as what? There it is. As what? Enemies of the cross of Christ. How do they display that they're enemies? Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. They glory in their shame. With minds set on what? earthly things. They're all about now. They have no heavenly usefulness because their desire is my kingdom come, my will be done for me right now so that I can get what's mine. But God's people should be different. Our citizenship is where? In heaven. And from it we await a what? a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like His glorious body by the power that enables Him even to subject all things to Himself. You know what that subject all things points over to another passage where Paul says that the Lord will put all of His enemies underfoot. Friends, if this is you, By the authority of God's Word, I say today, repent, believe in Jesus Christ, find life in Him, find redemption out of this, find a way by which you can move from being an enemy of righteousness and an enemy of the cross and find life in the One who is the Prince of Peace and our wisdom and our righteousness and our life before God. Seek Him, look to Him. Pray this prayer, God, have mercy on me, a sinner, or God, help me in my unbelief. God, rescue me from where I am because I find myself today your enemy and not right before you. And if I stay among the fellowship, what's likely to happen is a tinderbox of explosiveness because my glory is not you and it's not the cross and it's not Christ, it's me. God, save me. Help me. Because notice, to be outside of Jesus Christ and under the banner of the world is to find yourself in deadness and spiritual darkness. Which is why he says next, or do you suppose it's of no purpose that the Scripture says he yearns jealously over the Spirit that he has made to dwell in us? In other words, this verse could be taken a few different ways. But in the context, the way I'm taking it is he's saying, this should not be. In a place where the people are saying the source of our hearts is sweet water, there should be sweet refreshness that's coming out of it. And God has this jealous that His glory would be on display. Could you imagine right now, today, right this moment, if a guy or a lady walked down the streets of the Ukraine Gun in hand, Ukrainian citizen. They've got the passport to show it. And they're walking through the streets of Ukraine. And and they're declaring all of the, the things that the Ukrainians would say, down with Putin, we're for Ukraine, we want freedom, no, no more war. And meanwhile, they've got this blazoned image on their shirt that is says, I love Putin, and it's the face of Putin. And they've got this money that's coming in every day from the Kremlin, just pouring in money. And they have these invitations to come in and and get new information from the Kremlin. Could you imagine what would happen to that person in the Ukraine? They'd probably get shot. By who? Well, it depends, right? They might get shot by the Russian troops, even though it seems like they're on the side of who? Putin. Or they might get shot by the Ukrainian people, even though they're fully Ukrainian citizens, because it looks like they're what? 
Putins. They look like Ukrainians, but they're acting like Russians. Friends, there's no place for God's people to look and act like the world. You can't serve two masters. You'll love one and hate the other, despise the other. Because where your treasure is, that's exactly where your heart goes, right? But here's good news. Praise be to God. Notice verse 6. But God gives more what? Grace. Look, Putin has no place for traitors. His enemies, he annihilates them. The truth is the Ukrainians have no place for their enemies. They're seeking to kill them. But you know what God does for His enemies? He lays down His life. He sheds His blood. He gives more grace. He makes it such that while we were yet sinners and His enemies, He lays down His life for us. That's the kind of God I want to worship and serve. You know why? Because I had never deserved it. I had never could earn it, and I shouldn't have been, and yet He did it because of the very great love with which He loved us. And He made it possible for us who are under the wrath of God and in darkness and in spiritual climate of just destructiveness, and He made it possible for us to be transformed into His saints, trophies, of His grace. He gives more grace. And not only that, that's why it says He opposes the proud. Those who would say, I don't care if I'm God's enemy. He's not going to do anything to me. I'll just keep going because, look, I keep getting all the things that I want. Those who are proud, you can be sure He will oppose. But those who are humbled, what does it say? He'll what? He gives grace to the humble. He gives grace and salvation. And not only that, you know what else He does? He gives grace for those who are struggling with temptation and struggling in difficulty and those who are oppressed and those who find themselves weak. He gives grace. He makes it possible for us to rest in His goodness and His righteousness and His love. What an amazing God, amen? Now, make no mistake, one day there will be a time of judgment that will come for those who proudly oppose God. But for those who will humble themselves today, you know what you will find? Rest. And you'll find streams of living water that satisfy and life and peace in Christ. Find it. Rest there. And when we are resting there, you know what will happen as His people? Well, that's next week. Come back and we'll see what it will look like and what it should look like for those who are resting in the peace of this God. But today, Seek Christ. Find Him as the hope of what you're looking for. Let's pray. Father, we thank You and we praise You for this hope. We thank You for what it is that You have done for us. And Father, we are utterly amazed by this and, and we ought to be absolutely humbled by this because we know that the truth is every one of us in this room we were friends with the world. We were walking in lockstep and barrel with the world. And we were satisfying all the pleasures and the desires of our hearts. But you, because of the very great love with which you loved us and according to your great mercy, you made us alive together with your Son. Father, I pray that there would be some, even by 
camera or in this place physically who would cry out to you and, and cling to you, that they would see the beauty of your glory on display in Jesus Christ shine in their hearts. And out of that, let there be repentance and belief and life eternal. And as a result, let there be a sweetness in our fellowship, in our homes, and in our manner of our living. Because now our minds are set not on earthly things, but where our citizenship is in heavenly places. So God, we praise you and thank you for your son and what it is that he did for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand, let's sing as we finish this morning.
God, there is no one like you, and we thank you for uh, the grace that you have so lavished on us that while we were sinners, you have called us children of God. We ask that you would continue to do a work in our hearts this week. Help us to live for you, um, to keep our eyes fixed on you, the author and the perfecter of our faith. Help us to rest knowing that you are good and that you're with us. And help us to be uh, emboldened to take that truth to our neighbors and to our coworkers, the people we come into contact with. Um, you're such a good God, and we thank you for that. And we pray this all in your son's name. Amen.
gathers families, orphans and refugees, and buys the wounds of those who mourn. The humble lift it high, the proud he casts aside, his justice faithful as. Yet mercy will prevail, his love will 